On this edition for Saturday, April 6th, the president continues his push against immigration. In our signature story, a different border story playing out on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola and an outpost of London's B&A Museum along the River Tay in Scotland. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. President Trump used a speech to the Republican Jewish Coalition's annual leadership meeting in Las Vegas today to repeat his claim that there is a crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border and that asylum seekers should be turned back. And I told my people yesterday, our country is full. We're full. Our system is full. Our country is full. Can't come in. Our country is full. What can you do? We can't handle anymore. Our country is full. Can't come in. I'm sorry. It's very simple. Although the president backed off of a threat to close the border earlier this week, he told the crowd of supporters that he would do it if Mexico does not block migrants. Unfortunately, Democrats have refused to close immigration loopholes. That's really what it's all about. And again, Mexico has apprehended 1,400 people yesterday, 1,000 people the day before. They've never done this, never to the extent. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But if they don't do it, I'm going to close the border or I'm going to do tariffs on the cars made in Mexico. They took 30 percent of our car business. By the way, I wasn't here when that happened, okay? I used to complain about it as a civilian. I complained. I said, what the hell is going on? The president spent part of yesterday at the U.S.-Mexico border, pointing out a rebuilt section of wall completed last fall and claiming it as part of the wall he's been demanding be built since his 2016 campaign. For more on the president's visit and what's next, Michelle Marisco, senior editor for public radio station KJZZ's Fronteras Desk, joins us now via Skype from Tucson, Arizona. Thanks for being with us. You know, right now we have the president kind of backing off of the let's seal the border completely threat. But what happens each time the president says something like this to the local businesses, the residents that actually live along the border? Two things happen. Uh, first, there are partial shutdowns. Uh, let's start there. Um, those started at about the same time that he initiated the first threat about a week and a half ago. What's been happening is they have been partially closing down certain shipping lanes between the U.S. and Mexico at Otoy Mesa, at, uh, let's say, at El Paso and Juarez, and then here in Nogales. Um, those are already adding hours of wait time, for example, in El Paso, upwards of nine and ten hours of shipping just waiting in Mexico to cross. At the same time, this is also really concerning investors. You know, the border is trying to draw investment, trying to draw new flows of cash to these areas for, for uh, building, for maquiladoras, for technology. Um, this is uh, scaring people away, and this is a huge, tremendous concern for people, for example, here in Mogadis. What about execution of that? of these orders, of these shutdowns, who's on the front lines? I mean, the Border Patrol doesn't have an uh, increased number of staff to go along with this. I'm, I'm imagining they're just, what, working longer hours? Well, what they, what they did was they diverted Customs and Border Protection officers, these are the customs inspectors, away from these lanes and then put them to work with U.S. Border Patrol agents, uh, the agents who patrol between the ports of entry, uh, to, to help regulate and administer to the needs of asylum seekers. But then what ended up happening is uh, we already have a shortage of CBP officers along the entire border. And so... Now we have even less officers that can be dedicated to the task of continuing the, the flow of, of goods and people and services across the border. What about the Mexican government's response to all this? So Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador has, has played a very careful role here. Uh, in, in, in the first case, he's, he's been somewhat dismissive. He said that he didn't believe President Trump would actually shut down the border. He was right about that. Um, but he has also been boxing himself into a corner where even though he, he continues to give small concessions, for example, there is at least a suggestion that Mexico has been increasing deportations of Central Americans on behalf of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, every time that they give a little bit of acquiescence there, the criticism has been coming in that the U.S. just demands even more from Mexico. 
KJZZ and the Frontera's desk is Michel Marisco joining us via Skype today from Tucson. Thanks so much. Thank you. To learn how President Trump's threats to close the border and impose tariffs on Mexico are impacting the automobile and agricultural industries, visit pbs.org slash newshour. There's another border story playing out in our hemisphere on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. The Dominican Republic and Haiti sit side by side, yet have a complex and fraught history. During the 20th century, hundreds of thousands of Haitians crossed into the wealthier Dominican Republic to escape poverty and political instability, only to face color-based racism and, at times, violent repression. Recently, in what international human rights organizations took to be a swipe at those with Haitian roots, the Dominican government made headlines when it ended birthright citizenship for children born in the Dominican Republic to undocumented parents. News Hour Weekend's Yvette Feliciano has more as part of our ongoing series on Haiti. January in the Dominican Republic city of Himani, near the main border crossing into Haiti. Earlier in the day, 34-year-old Jesus Lom Exilaire says he was detained. Exilaire, a Baptist pastor, says he was unjustly held by Dominican immigration authorities for six hours. They come and ask me, hey you, black guy, where are your documents? I took them out and they said, get on the truck. And while we drove, I asked, what is the problem here? I have my documents. And they said they had to verify. Exilaire was born in the Dominican Republic to Haitian migrants, and he is a legal resident here. But he is not a Dominican citizen, and he cannot vote. That's because, according to the Dominican government, his Haitian heritage makes Exilaire a foreigner in the country of his birth. They call you illegal. They say you are not from here, you are Haitian. Go to your country. Most of us don't even know Haiti. We don't know anyone there. It used to be that, with few exceptions, being born in the DR made you a citizen. But constitutional and legal revisions that took full effect in 2014 changed all that. Under the new law, many Dominicans born to undocumented parents between 1929 and 2007 would lose their citizenship. So would their children, their children's children, and on and on. The Dominican government has no estimate of the total number of people affected, but human rights groups estimate hundreds of thousands suddenly lost their citizenship. They were no longer eligible to vote, enroll in higher education, or legally work in the country. I'm from the Dominican Republic. I am not from Haiti. And they say, no, you are here, but you are Haitian. Dominican lawmakers said changes to nationality laws were aimed at tackling decades of illegal migration from Haiti. That's not the opinion of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, a watchdog arm of the Organization of American States. It claims the new laws are part of a legacy of racial discrimination, xenophobia, and anti-Haitianism in Dominican society. If I'm walking, since I have black skin, they ask for my passport. Jivena Reyes, who is Dominican of Haitian heritage, is a human rights worker. There are Dominicans with black skin, and there are Haitians with white skin. I don't understand why they don't hold everyone to the same standard. Many Dominicans walk around without their documents, and if you have no documents on you, how do you prove your nationality? Reyes says there is historical precedent for the charge of racial discrimination. In the 20th century, tens of thousands of Haitians most of them black, migrated to the Dominican Republic to work in sugarcane fields and construction. But in 1937, Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo, in an outspoken effort to make Dominican society homogenous and lighter skinned, called for the execution of all Haitians in the country. Tens of thousands of Haitian sugarcane laborers were killed by soldiers and Dominican citizens, Decades of colorism and anti-Haitian legislation followed. Vigilante killings of Haitians by Dominicans were documented as recently as 2015. Racism is seen on a daily basis. When I was growing up, since I have black skin, children would call me Haitian devil. That's what they call you. They see you as less than them. 
Reyes works at Centro Montalvo, a Haitian rights advocacy group in the Dominican Republic. In 2014 and 15, she and other advocates here helped Dominican-born Haitian descendants go through a new registration process the government demanded. Anyone born to undocumented parents and not found in the country's civil registry had to register with the government as a foreigner or face deportation. They gave me documents that say foreigner, and in the back it says cannot vote. I feel it shouldn't be. It is not right. For the children of migrants, things have changed dramatically. Cristina Cuevas Florian is what's known as a human rights defender with Centro Montalvo. They have been stripped of their nationality, they have been stripped of everything. Many have had to grow up fast and mature to the point where they can defend themselves and understand their rights and become documented. But many people weren't allowed to register, according to international observers, including Amnesty International. It claimed the government process was a legal maze that most found impossible to navigate, and some were deported during the registration period without due process. In response, Dominican President Danilo Medina complained the country was wrongly being branded as anti-migrant and racist. He said it was simply implementing its laws and exercising its sovereignty. But based on the Dominican government's own numbers, fewer than 5 percent of denationalized Dominicans of Haitian descent successfully registered with the government. When the registration process ended, they started picking up masses of people. Many of those who lived here had their children here, spent years here. They had to leave to Haiti. There were even moments when they went into people's homes to grab them. They'd run after people, so people still feel fear. More than 200,000 Dominicans of Haitian descent and undocumented Haitian migrants either fled or were deported to Haiti between 2015 and 2017, according to the International Organization for Migration. Here, on the Haitian side of the border, makeshift camps sprung up. Willie Pierre works for the Jesuit Haitian Rights Organization, SJM, a French acronym which in English stands for Solidarity with Migrants Along the Haitian Border. They don't have Haitian or Dominican birth certificates. Even though they were born on Dominican soil, it's the Dominicans who decided to take away their Dominican citizenship, and they no longer recognize them as Dominican, and we can't recognize them as Haitian. They don't have their feet on any soil. The Dominican-born Haitians became, and remain, effectively stateless. 42-year-old Virgena Jean, a Haitian national, lived in the Dominican Republic for more than two decades. She says four of her children were born there and thus were citizens before the new rules took effect, but they were all deported here to Haiti. I was at the market selling food when they went to my house and took my kids. They put them in a vehicle and took them to Haiti. Her 15-year-old son, Innocent, says his experience with an immigration officer was traumatizing. He just said, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I said, wait, we just need to grab something. And he said, no, you can't go get anything. Let's go, let's go. And he grabbed me and put me on the bus. When she learned where they were several hours later, Jean joined her children in Haiti just across the border. They settled here in Fon Bayard, a community made up of deportees and others who have joined them. When they brought us here, we had no family here. We had no idea what we were going to do. According to Pierre, many people have settled here because they have nowhere else to go, with little or no connections in Haiti and no way to earn a living. In fact, he says many pay bribes to guards to illegally re-enter the Dominican Republic in search of work. They do domestic work in the house or in the garden. Many have families here who are counting on them. But he says most of them are simply sent back to Haiti. Meanwhile, advocates say Dominicans of Haitian descent who remain in the Dominican Republic live in a perpetual state of fear. A team of lawyers, social workers, and volunteers at Centro Montalvo serve as observers at the border and at military checkpoints along Dominican highways. They say they document rights abuses by Dominican authorities.
Sometimes they stop me at the checkpoint, and they tell me my documents are not valid, and they ask me for 200 pesos. But I was told that with these documents, I shouldn't have to pay a single peso. Despite his legal residency in the Dominican Republic, Exilere has been detained three times in the last year by immigration officials. I said to them, well, if this is how it works, it is impossible to be here legally. You are going to be picked up whether you have documents or not. It is like we have no value. Authorities at the Dominican Republic's Immigration Enforcement Agency, CESFRONT, declined a formal interview. But they told us they investigate any officer accused of asking for or accepting bribes, and that many have been fined and, in some cases, fired. But officers also admitted that they routinely detain people by racially profiling them. Exilere says his wife, parents, and several of his siblings were not able to register with the Dominican government, and they live here illegally. They rarely leave their neighborhood for fear of deportation. He says his faith in God helps him cope with his worries about the future. Dundee, Scotland, a coastal city of 150,000, is in the middle of a reinvention its citizens hope will make it a major center for the arts. It may be too soon for comparisons to Europe's many cultural capitals, but if a new museum is any indication, Dundee might be well on its way. It's not like any other building in town. The first outpost of London's famed Victoria and Albert Museum sits on the edge of the River Tay in Dundee, Scotland. You can almost see the hull of a ship in the building's design, a nod to the city's maritime past. More than 2,400 panels of layered concrete hang from the exterior of the V&A Dundee Museum, as it's known here. World-renowned architect Kengo Kuma says his design inspiration came from Scotland's iconic cliffs. Those cliff forms around Scotland's coastline are such an important uh, aspect, such an important quality of this, of this country. Philip Long is the director of the V&A Dundee. He oversaw the museum through the three and a half years it took to build, at a cost of more than $100 million. A great deal of that time was just in constructing this extraordinary external form. It's characterized by these leaning, twisting forms that put enormous pressures, um, physical pressures, uh, on the building's structure. It's cast in concrete in situ, and that itself was a very complex process. Inside, oak panels line the walls, and then there's the open space. It's meant to be part museum, part meetup site, and part living room of sorts for the city. The goal of V&A Dundee is to present the breadth of Scotland's design history and ongoing innovation under one roof. So within the museum, two main galleries carry a mix of objects. It's reputed that the first shot fired in the American War of Independence was made with um, a Scottish pistol. Curator Meredith Moore took us on a tour of the permanent galleries. So how much of Scottish design plays into a sense of identity for the people here? So this set of galleries is really the first um, display that's really looking at Scottish design in particular rather than Scottish history, Scottish art. And obviously we were keen to think about what is unique about Scottish design and whether there's um, aspects about our geography or our natural resources or our history and political alliances that have sort of impacted on the particular design disciplines that have mm -hmm. become successful here. There are once daring pieces. Take this 1930s swimsuit manufactured by the famed Speedo company. Speedo was founded by a Scotsman living in Australia. No sleeves meant swimsuits like these were banned on some beaches for being too revealing. The galleries also showcase locally made furniture. What's this throne doing here? <laughs> Um, so this is a chair made in Orkney, which is one of the mm -hmm. uh, northern islands of Scotland. And the islanders would make furniture from anything that they could find, so mostly driftwood and straw. The River Tay once carried the city's main export, processed jute, to the rest of the world. Manufacturing the jute plant into textile employed close to half of all Dundonians at one point. But by the early 1900s, Dundee could not compete with cheaper jute textiles from countries like India and started losing its edge. The city has since struggled to regain that economic strength. Now, local officials are hoping the V&A will be a major part of its revitalization. John Alexander heads the Dundee City Council. 
whilst it's a small institution in itself, it has around 80 employees, the difference it's making to bring in that vibrancy back to a city that for many years had lost, I suppose, its way, mm. um, cannot be discounted. It is significant and it is something that we're really proud of. The council and local partners worked for years to bring VNA to Dundee. In fact, Alexander was a child when discussions began on just how to reinvigorate this struggling city. You do need to speculate to accumulate and you need to invest in opportunities for your people. This public garden we walk through is just one part of a $1.2 billion waterfront regeneration investment. The 600-acre area is part of a 30-year plan to build and improve commercial and cultural sites with the hope of attracting tourists and businesses. And 18 years in, there is new housing, a renovated train station, additional mixed-use buildings for retail, offices and hotels, and new attractions like the V&A Museum. The V&A is perhaps a good example of that aspiration and what we're set to deliver hopefully over the next 10, 20 years in using culture and regeneration as a way of reinvigorating both the economy but also the social side of the city as well. How is it working so far? Well, Alexander points to a 10% increase in hotel stays as one positive sign. And six months after its opening, the museum has already welcomed more than half a million visitors, far exceeding expectations. That popularity has spurred some to compare the V&A Dundee to the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, a cultural institution that helped turn the declining Spanish port city into a world-famous tourist destination. I think it's, of course, a comparison that anybody has to be very careful with, especially in my business, because the Guggenheim in Bilbao has been so successful. But let's not forget that cultural developments in cities have always been a really, really important part of the life of a city. So I hope it's a project which is very much being taken to the heart of people here in Dundee, but hopefully also is attracting interest from around the world and the ability of this place to do exciting and bold things, even though it's a city that's faced many difficulties in the past. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. We wanted to take you to another unique place in Scotland, the Orkney Islands. It's home to one of the largest archaeological digs in the world and the site of a discovery that's upended how we think of Neolithic societies that existed about 5,000 years ago. They've obviously never, ever been used. In a small house turned research base, archaeologist Nick Card shows off a 5,000-year-old polished stone axe. And you can see the edges, you know, just, it's not been damaged at all. Just perfect as the day it was made. Card is the director of the Ness of Brodgar, a massive excavation in Orkney, an archipelago of islands off the northern coast of Scotland. When we visited, the site was closed for the season, but underneath these tarps is a place that has yielded hundreds of thousands of artifacts and evidence of a complex society at the end of the Stone Age. It wasn't this kind of knuckle-dragging Neanderthals. This was a very sophisticated people who understood cosmology, who understood um, agriculture, and who managed to bring to bear a whole range of different skills and techniques onto what they were doing here. Built around 3300 BC, the Ness was a complex of stone buildings, some with walls more than 13 feet thick. It was in use for almost a thousand years before it was abandoned. The site sits between two sets of stone circles, one of which predates the iconic Stonehenge by centuries. But discovery of the nest was much more recent. In 2004, when this field in front of us was last ploughed, a big stone slab turned up. When we opened up just a small trench over the top of that, it turned out to be the top of one of these massive Neolithic structures. After more than a decade of digging, Card says there's still tons left to discover at the Ness. He estimates that about 10% has been uncovered. This year's excavation gets underway in July. Finally tonight, former six-term Democratic U.S. Senator and Governor of South Carolina Ernest Fritz Hollings died today, first elected to the South Carolina State Legislature in 1948 at age 26. Hollings went on to become Lieutenant Governor and then Governor. In his 1958 race for Governor, he campaigned against desegregation, but later backed public school integration. He retired from the Senate in 2005 and returned home where he gave lectures at a Charleston Law School and helped raise money for the Medical University of South Carolina's Cancer Center, which bears his name. Senator Hollings was 97 years old. 
That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.